Section 2 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Jackson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 2. Selected Works by William Ellery Channing. William Ellery Channing, 1780-1842. Channing, the recognized leader, although not the originator of the Unitarian movement in this country, was a man of singular spirituality, sweetness of disposition, purity of life, and nobility of character. He was thought by some to be an austere and cold in temperament and timid in action, but this was rather a misconception of a life given to conscientious study and an effort to allow do wait to opposing arguments. He was not liable to be swept from his moorings by momentary enthusiasm. As a writer, he was clear and direct, admirably perspicuous in style, without great ornament, much addicted to short and simple sentences, though singularly enough an admirer of those which were long and involved. A critic in Fraser's magazine wrote of him, Channing is unquestionably the first writer of the age. From his writings may be extracted some of the richest poetry and richest conceptions clothed in language, unfortunately for our literature, too little studied in the day in which we live. He was of blue blood, the grandson of William Ellery, one of the signers of the Declaration, and was born at Newport, Rhode Island, April 7, 1780. He was graduated at Harvard College with high honors in 1798 and first thought of studying medicine, but was inclined to the direction of the ministry. He became a private tutor in Richmond, Virginia, where he learned to detest slavery. Here he laid the seeds of subsequent physical troubles by imprudent indulgence in asceticism, in a desire to avoid effeminacy. He entered upon a study of theology, which he continued in Cambridge. He was ordained in 1803, and soon became pastor of the Federal Street Church in Boston, in charge of which society he passed his ministerial life. In the following year, he was associated with Buckminster and others in the liberal congregational movement, and this led him into a position of controversy with his unorthodox brethren, one he cordially disliked. But he could not refrain from preaching the doctrines of the dignity of human nature, the supremacy of reason, and religious freedom, of whose truth he was profoundly assured. It has been truly said that Channing was too much a lover of free thought, and too desirous to hold only what he thought to be true, to allow himself to be bound by any party ties. I wish, he himself said, to regard myself as belonging not to a sect, but to the community of free minds, of lovers of truth and followers of Christ, both on earth and in heaven. I desire to escape the narrow walls of a particular church, and to stand under the open sky in the broad light, looking far and wide, seeing with my own eyes, hearing with my own ears, and following truth meekly but resolutely, however arduous or solitary be the path in which she leads. He was greatly interested in temperance, in the anti-slavery movement, in the elevation of the laboring classes, and other social reforms. And after 1824, when Dr. Gannett became associate pastor, he gave much time to the work in these directions. His death occurred at Bennington, Vermont, April 2, 1842. His literary achievements are mainly or wholly in the line of his work, sermons, addresses, and essays, but they were prepared with scrupulous care and have the quality naturally to be expected from a man of broad and Catholic spirit, wide interests, and a strong love of literature. His works in six volumes are issued by the American Unitarian Association, which also publishes a memorial by his nephew, William Henry Channing in three volumes. The Passion for Power, from the Life and Character of Napoleon Bonaparte The passion for ruling, though most completely developed in despotisms, is confined to no forms of government. It is the chief peril of free states, the natural enemy of free institutions. It agitates our own country and still throws an uncertainty over the great experiment we are making here in behalf of liberty. It is the distinction of Republican institutions that whilst they compel the passion for power to moderate its pretensions and to satisfy itself with more limited gratifications, they tend to spread it more widely through the community and to make it a universal principle. 
the doors of office being opened to all, crowds burn to rush in. A thousand hands are stretched out to grasp the reins which are denied to none. Perhaps in this boasted and boasting land of liberty, not a few, if called to the state of the chief good of a republic, would place it in this, that every man is eligible to every office, and that the highest places of power and trust are prizes for universal competition. The superiority attributed by many to our institutions is not that they secure the greatest freedom, but give every man a chance of ruling, not that they reduce the power of government within the narrowest limits which the safety of the state admits, but throw it into as many hands as possible. The despot's great crime is thought to be that he keeps the delight of dominion to himself, that he makes a monopoly of it, whilst our more generous institutions, by breaking it into parcels and inviting the multitude to scramble for it, spread this joy more widely. The result is that political ambition infects our country and generates a feverish restlessness and discontent, which to the monarchist may seem more than a balance for our forms of liberty. The spirit of intrigue, which in absolute governments is confined to courts, walks abroad through the land, and as individuals can accomplish no political purposes single-handed, they ban themselves into parties ostensibly framed for public ends, but aiming only at the acquisition of power. The nominal sovereign, that is, the people, like all other sovereigns, is courted and flattered and told it can do no wrong. Its pride is pampered, its passions its flamed, its prejudices made inveterate. Such are the processes by which other republics have been subverted, and he must be blind who cannot trace them among ourselves. We mean not to exaggerate our dangers. We rejoice to know that the improvements of society oppose many checks to the love of power. But every wise man who seeks its workings must dread it as one chief foe. This passion derives strength and vehemence in our country from the common idea that political power is the highest prize which society has to offer. We know not a more general delusion, nor is it the least dangerous. Instilled as it is in our youth, it gives infinite excitement to political ambition. It turns the active talents of the country to the public station as the supreme good and makes us restless, intriguing, and unprincipled. It calls out hosts of selfish competitors for comparatively few places and encourages a bold, unblushing pursuit of personal elevation, which a just moral sense and self-respect in the community would frown upon and cover with shame. The Causes of War From a Discourse Delivered Before the Congregational Ministers of Massachusetts One of the great springs of war may be found in a very strong and general propensity of human nature, in the love of excitement, of emotion, of strong interest, a propensity which gives charm to those bold and hazardous enterprises which call forth all the energies of our nature. No state of mind, not even positive suffering, is more painful than the want of interesting objects. The vacant soul preys on itself, and often rushes with impatience from the security which demands no effort to the brink of peril. This part of human nature is seen in the kind of pleasures which have always been preferred. Why has the first rank among sports been given to the chase? Because its difficulties, hardships, hazards, tumults awaken the mind, and give it a new conscience of existence, and a deep feeling of its powers. What is the charm which attaches the statesman to an office which almost weighs him down with labor and an appalling responsibility? He finds much of his compensation in the powerful emotion and interest awakened by the very hardships of his lot, by conflict with vigorous minds, by the opposition of rivals, by the alternations of success and defeat. What hurries to the gaming tables the man of prosperous fortune and ample resources? The dread of apathy, the love of strong feeling, and of mental agitation. A deeper interest is felt in hazarding than in securing wealth, and the temptation is irresistible. Another powerful principle of our nature, which is the spring of war, is the passion for superiority, for triumph, for power. The human mind is aspiring, impatient of inferiority, and eager for control. I need not enlarge on the predominance of this passion in rulers, whose love of power is influenced by its possession, and who are ever restless to extend their sway. It is more important to observe that were this desire restrained to the breasts of rulers, war would move with a sluggish pace. But the passion for power and superiority is universal, and as every individual, from his intimate union with the community, is accustomed to appropriate its triumphs to himself, 
there is a general promptness to engage in any contest by which the community may obtain an ascendancy over other nations. The desire that our country should surpass all others would not be criminal did we understand in which respects it is most honorable for a nation to excel. Do we feel that the glory of the state consists in intellectual and moral superiority, in preeminence of knowledge, freedom, and purity? But to the mass of the people, this form of preeminence is too refined and unsubstantial. There is another kind of triumph which they better understand, the triumph of physical power, triumph in battle, triumph not over the minds, but the territory of another state. Here is a palpable, visible superiority, and for this a people are willing to submit to severe privations. A victory blots out the memory of their sufferings, and in boasting of their extended power they find a compensation for many woes. Another powerful spring of war is the admiration of the brilliant qualities displayed in war. Many delight in war, not for its carnage and woes, but for its valor and apparent magnanimity, for the self-command of the hero, the fortitude which despises suffering, the resolution which courts danger, the superiority of the mind to the body, to sensation, to fear. Men seldom delight in war, considered merely as a source of misery. When they hear of battles, the picture which rises to their view is not what it should be, a picture of extreme wretchedness of the wounded, the mangled, the slain. These horrors are hidden under the splendor of those mighty energies which break forth amidst the perils of conflict, and which human nature contemplates with an intense and heart-thrilling delight whilst the peaceful sovereign who scatters blessings with the silence and consistency of providence is received with a faint applause, men assemble in crowds to hail the conqueror, perhaps a monster in human form, whose private life is blackened with lust and crime, and whose greatness is built on perfidy and usurpation. Thus war is the surest and speediest way to renown, and war will never cease while the field of battle is the field of glory, and the most luxuriant laurels grow from a root nourished with blood. Spiritual Freedom From the Discourse on Spiritual Freedom, 1830 I consider the freedom or moral strength of the individual mind as the supreme good, and the highest end of government. I am aware that other views are often taken. It is said that government is intended for the public, for the community, not for the individual. The idea of a national interest prevails in the minds of statesmen, and to this it is thought that the individual may be sacrificed. But I would maintain that the individual is not made for the state so much as the state for the individual. A man is not created for political relations as his highest end, but for indefinite spiritual progress, and is placed in political relations as the means of his progress. The human soul is greater, more sacred than the state, and must never be sacrificed to it. The human soul is to outlive all earthly institutions. The distinction of nations is to pass away. Thrones which have stood for ages are to meet the doom pronounced upon all man's works. But the individual mind survives, and the obscurest subject, if true to God, will rise to power never wielded by earthly potentates. A human being is a member of the community, not as a limb is a member of the body, or as a wheel is a part of a machine intended only to contribute to some general joint result. He was created not to be merged in the whole, as a drop in the ocean, or as a particle of sand on a seashore, and to aid only in composing a mass. He is an ultimate being, made for his own perfection as his highest end, made to maintain an individual existence, and to serve others only as far as consists with his own virtue and progress. Hitherto governments have tended greatly to obscure this importance of the individual, to depress him in his own eyes, to give him the idea of an outward interest more important than the invisible soul, and of outward authority more sacred than the voice of God in his own secret conscience. Rulers have called the private man the property of the state, meaning generally by the state themselves, and thus the many have been immolated to the few, and have even believed that this was their highest destination." These views cannot be too earnestly withstood. Nothing seems to me so needful as to give the mind the consciousness, which governments have done so much to suppress, of its own separate worth. Let the individual feel that through his immortality he may concentrate in his own being a greater good than that of nations. Let him feel that he is placed in the community, not to part with his individuality or to become a tool, but that he should find a sphere for his various powers, 
and a preparation for immortal glory. To me, the progress of society consists in nothing more than in bringing out the individual in giving him a consciousness of his own being and in quickening him to strengthen and elevate his own mind. In thus maintaining that the individual is the end of social institutions, I may be thought to discourage public efforts and the sacrifice of private interests to the state. Far from it. No man, I affirm, will serve his fellow beings so effectually, so fervently, as he who is not their slave, as he who, casting off every other yoke, subjects himself to the law of duty in his own mind. For this law enjoins a disinterested and generous spirit, as man's glory and likeness to his maker. Individuality, or moral self-subsistence, is the surest foundation of an all-comprehending love. No man so multiplies his bonds with the community as he who watches most jealously over his own perfection. There is a beautiful harmony between the good of the state and the moral freedom and dignity of the individual. Were it not so, were these interests in any case discordant, were an individual ever called to serve his country by acts debasing his own mind, he ought not to waver a moment as the good which he should prefer. Property, life, he should joyfully surrender to the state, but his soul he must never stain or enslave. From poverty, pain, the rack, the gibbet, he should not recoil, but for no good of others ought he to part with self-control or violate the inward law. We speak of the patriot as sacrificing himself to the public wheel. Do we mean that he sacrifices what is most properly himself, the principle of piety and virtue? Do we not feel that however great may be the good which through his sufferings accrues to the state, a greater and purer glory redounds to himself, and that the most precious fruit of his disinterested services is the strength of resolution and philanthropy which is accumulated in his own soul? The advantages of civilization have their peril. In such a state of society, opinion and law impose salutary restraint and produce general order and security. But the power of opinion grows into a despotism which more than all things represses original and free thought, subverts individuality of character, reduces the community to a spiritless monotony, and chills the love of perfection. Religion, considered simply as the principle which balances the power of human opinion, which takes man out of the grasp of custom and fashion, and teaches him to refer to himself to a higher tribunal, is an infinite aid to moral strength and elevation. An important benefit of civilization, of which we hear much from the political economist, is the division of labor, by which arts are perfected. But this, by confining the mind to an unceasing round of petty operations, tends to break it into littleness. We possess improved fabrics, but deteriorated men. Another advantage of civilization is that manners are refined and accomplishments multiplied, but these are continually seen to supplant simplicity of character, strength of feeling, the love of nature, the love of inward beauty and glory. Under outward courtesy we see a cold selfishness, a spirit of calculation and little energy of love. I confess I look round on civilized society with many fears, and with more and more earnest desire that a regenerating spirit from heaven, from religion, may descend upon and pervade it. I particularly fear that various causes are acting powerfully among ourselves to inflame and madden that enslaving and degrading principle, the passion for property. For example, the absence of hereditary distinctions in our country gives prominence to the distinction of wealth and holds up this as the chief prize to ambition. Add to this the Epicurean self-indulgent habits which our prosperity has multiplied and which crave insatiably for enlarging wealth as the only means of gratification. This peril is increased by the spirit of our times, which is a spirit of commerce, industry, internal improvements, mechanical invention, political economy, and peace. Think not that I would disparage commerce, mechanical skill, and especially pacific connections among states, but there is danger that these blessings may, by perversion, issue in a slavish love of lucre. It seems to me that some of the objects which once moved men most powerfully are gradually losing their sway, and thus the mind is left more open to the excitement of wealth. For example, military distinction is taking the inferior place which it deserves, and the consequence will be that energy and ambition, which have been exhausted in war, will seek new directions, and happy shall we be if they do not flow into the channel of gain. 
So I think that political eminence is to be less and less coveted, and there is danger that the energies absorbed by it will be spent in seeking another kind of dominion, the dominion of property. And if such be the result, what shall we gain by what is called the progress of society? What shall we gain by national peace if men, instead of meeting on the field of battle, wage with one another the more inglorious strife of dishonest and rapacious traffic? What shall we gain by the waning of political ambition if the intrigues of the exchange take place in those of the cabinet and private pomp and luxury be substituted for the splendor of public life? I am no foe to civilization. I rejoice in its progress. But I mean to say that without a pure religion to modify its tendencies, to inspire and refine it, we shall be corrupted, not ennobled by it. It is the excellence of the religious principle that it aids and carries forward civilization, extends science and arts, multiplies the conveniences and ornaments of life, and at the same time spoils them of their enslaving power, and even converts them into means and ministers of that spiritual freedom which when left to themselves they endanger and destroy. In order, however, that religion should yield its full and best fruit, one thing is necessary, and the times require that I should state it with great distinctness. It is necessary that religion should be held and professed in a liberal spirit, just as far as it assumes an intolerant, exclusive, sectarian form, it subverts instead of strengthening the soul's freedom, and becomes the heaviest and most galling yoke which is laid on the intellect and conscience. Religion must be viewed not as a monopoly of priests, ministers, or sects, not as conferring on any man a right to dictate to his fellow beings, not as an instrument by which the few may awe the many, not as bestowing on one a prerogative which is not enjoyed by all, but as the property of every human being and as the great subject for every human mind. It must be regarded as the revelation of a common father to whom all have equal access, who invites all to the like immediate communion, who has no favorites, who has appointed no infallible expounders of his will, who opens his works and word to every eye, and calls upon all to read for themselves, and to follow fearlessly the best convictions of their own understandings. Let religion be seized on by individuals or sects as their special province. Let them clothe themselves with God's prerogative of judgment. Let them succeed in enforcing their creed by penalties of law or penalties of opinion. Let them succeed in fixing a brand on virtuous men whose only crime is free investigation, and religion becomes the most blighting tyranny which can establish itself over the mind. You have all heard of the outward evils which religion, when thus turned into tyranny, has inflicted, how it has dug dreary dungeons, kindled fires for the martyr, and invented instruments of exquisite torture. But to me all this is less fearful than its influence over the mind. When I see the superstitions which is fastened on the conscience, the spiritual terrors with which it has haunted and subdued the ignorant and susceptible, the dark appalling views of God which it has spread far and wide, the dread of inquiry which it has struck into superior understandings, and the servility of spirit which it has made to pass for piety. When I see all this, the fire, the scaffold, and the outward inquisition, terrible as they are, seem to me inferior evils. I look with a solemn joy on the heroic spirits who have met, freely and fearlessly, pain and death in the cause of truth and human rights. But there are other victims of intolerance on whom I look with unmixed sorrow. They are those who, spellbound by early prejudice or by intimidations from the pulpit and the press, dare not think, who anxiously stifle every doubt or misgiving in regard to their opinions, as if to doubt were a crime, who shrink from the seekers after truth as from infection, who deny all virtue which does not wear the livery of their own sect, who, surrendering to others their best powers, receive unresistingly a teaching which wars against reason and conscience, and who think it a merit to impose on such as live within their influence the grievous bondage which they bear themselves. How much to be deplored is it that religion, the very principle which is designed to raise men above the judgment and power of man, should become the chief instrument of usurpation over the soul. End of section 2. Recording by Chad Jackson.